<clears throat> Welcome, folks. So nice to see you all. Uh, I'm Andy Hansen with uh, Institute on Ecosystems. And uh, we've been having a, a really wonderful uh, series of rough cut talks this semester uh, on the theme of uh, interdisciplinary research uh, challenges and successes. And uh, most of the speakers have been relatively recent hires, um, which uh, I find really interesting how the current generation of uh, leading new faculty are, uh, are doing science and interacting with others. Um, and so it's sure a pleasure to have Justin Becker with us. <coughs> Justine's a large male population ecologist. Her, her uh, PhD is from Princeton. She did a postdoc um, at the University of Wyoming working with uh, some of the key scientists that are doing uh, ungulate migration work there. And uh, already here, now has been here just the second semester, I think, and she's linked in with all sorts of projects folks on campus and elsewhere. Um, you might recall Justine's uh, the search we did last year where she was hired. It was a, a really strong pool of candidates. And Justine was just the overwhelming favorite in, uh, in our department. Um, so Justine Becker, rock star, large family <laughs> college. Wow. Uh, thanks, Andy. That was very Andy said I was, I guess, hired relatively recently, uh, so there will be some overlap between this talk and the seminar I gave uh, when I interviewed, but I have tried to inject a bunch of new content, so hopefully it won't be too much repetition for those of you that were there uh, for that presentation. So my title is a large mammal ecologist, but this is not uh, but broadly in my research, I focus on animal movement and specifically trying to understand how and why individual animals make the movement decisions that they do and then what the impacts of these decisions are for those individuals, but also for populations and ecological communities and even more broadly for ecosystem dynamics. And the reason why I find movement in particular so fascinating is because it's almost the central process or behavior in ecology, it connects so many other critical processes and functions. So animals need to move to do just about everything that they do to migrate, to disperse, to find food, or avoid becoming someone else's food. And because of movement being so central to so many different processes, itself it is a quite, quite a complicated um, behavior that involves a whole range of different potential causes. and can scale up to a wide range of different consequences. So when you observe an individual animal moving through the environment, often what we see are mule deer maybe walking along our, our street or <laughs> through our backyard, the causes that led that animal to make that decision in that particular time and place can range from a whole lot of different things, including things like what their predators are doing, what conspecifics are doing in the environment, their spatial memory or the cognitive capacity of that animal, but also their reproductive status, their age, and also the structure of the environment that they live in. And the consequences of these individual level decisions can scale up to impact individual survival um, and spatial distributions, but also impacting things like population dynamics, reproductive success, um, ecological community interactions and food webs, and ultimately also the distribution of species that we see um, around the globe. So by focusing on all these different pathways in this picture, what I like to try and do uh, in my research is really try and break it down into different segments um, of this overall picture and address this question of how wildlife interact with their habitat through their movement behavior. And in doing so, I aim to generate a more mechanistic understanding of these decisions and help to inform the management of these populations by better understanding their behavior and potentially using those behavioral pathways as um, effective management strategies. So today what I want to talk about are three different examples, and hopefully I'll have time to get through uh, the content of all of them, that 
thanks to more recent advances in technology, both in terms of tracking data, but also our ability to collect more remote, uh, remotely sensed information on the environment. Um, where we've looked at ways in which animals are responding to some of the unique challenges they're facing um, in today's world. And specifically in relation to how this is altering the relationship between wildlife um, and their habitats, uh, specifically in this era that we think of as the Anthropocene. I don't want to dive right in with probably the greatest challenge of them all that I really don't, needs no introduction because it's essentially one big super challenge that it covers a whole lot of sub challenges that both we and wildlife are trying to deal with on a daily basis. And that is, of course, climate change. And under the many challenges that climate change is presenting to our world, one of the most visible and kind of already uh, happening in our everyday lives is this increase in the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events. So things like cyclones, uh, wildfires, flooding events, blizzards. Um, any, kind of uh, any kind of extreme weather event, we've already noticed these things are starting to become more common and also more intense um, in our world. And in some of our recent research on wildlife in Sub-Saharan Africa, we've actually been able to assess how these events are impacting wildlife and altering their relationships with their habitat, and potentially make some predictions about how these communities are going to cope with this increased uh, frequency and intensity of these new weather events um, as they continue as climate change accelerates. So in March 2019, many of you may have heard about this, um, tropical cyclone Edai made landfall in Mozambique, and this was the strongest storm of this nature ever recorded um, in southern Africa. So it was an extremely large, devastating weather event that caused huge amounts of damage uh, to um, the human populations of this area, but also to uh, the unique wildlife populations that live in this region. And in particular, I'm going to focus on the effects on the animal community in Gorongosa National Park, where the cyclone, the path of the cyclone, actually passed directly over uh, Gorongosa here, which is shown as this darker uh, gray polygon, um, and where the animals living in this park had to deal with the extreme flooding and wind and all the other effects that uh, this type of cyclone event can um, create in the environment. So just a little bit of background about Gorongosa. It is itself actually a floodplain ecosystem, so it has distinct wet and dry seasons, with the wet season being characterized by intense rainfall. And so the animals that live in this, environment, in, in this environment are used to these annual flooding events, where this floodplain area shown in green floods um, every year uh, that surrounds Lake Urania, which is roughly uh, at the center of the park. So every year, rain uh, causes this green area here to flood. But the flooding that occurred with Cyclone Edai was far greater than this flooding extent. So what is extended far beyond this usual um, floodplain boundary. It also occurred at roughly the end of the typical rainy season. So in March, when things were perhaps beginning to slowly start drying out, and it was extremely rapid. So within 48 hours, there, in some parts of the park, there were over six meters uh, of floodwaters, um, and in areas that don't typically experience these kinds of floods. And just to give you an idea of how dramatic um, this looked in that you know, short 48-hour period, this is a structure out on uh, the floodplain in Gorongosa that was uh, previously an old lookout point known as Lion House. And this is actually out on the edge of the floodplain. Um, this was taken in the wet season, so you can see there is some water on the ground, but very little flooding actually occurred in this specific area. And this is what that same building looked like 48 hours after um, the cyclone hit. And so really all we can see is the ceiling of this building, and there's a person up there uh, if you want to get a sense of the scale. And so you can see what kind of challenges this may have presented to the animals living in this area when suddenly habitats that they're not used to being inundated were completely flooded. Um, and they had to figure out a way to cope with the situation in order to survive. So Gorongosa is a savanna ecosystem. It's home to a diverse community of large mammals. And at the time of the cyclone, we were conducting a whole range of different studies on the ecology of this community, um, including their movement behavior and their diet behavior. Um, and this is what allowed us to assess the impacts of the cyclone on these animals in kind of an opportunistic um, type study because of the ongoing data collection we had at the time. 
And because we were wanting to try and understand not just how this event impacted Gorongosa, but potentially how other events like this will continue to impact large mammal communities and how uh, they will respond to them in the future, we looked at two specific um, trade axes that are that vary among um, this large mammal community to try and see whether there were any predictable responses based along uh, variation in these two traits. The first was in their body size. So as you can see, there was a wide range of body size in the community that we were monitoring. Um, and then we also looked at whether there was variation response based on habitat preference and specifically how strongly associated each species was with the floodplain habitat, which was the habitat most heavily impacted. Um, by the floodwaters during the cyclone event. And we looked at their responses in both the short term and the long term to try and assess whether there were specific effects on behavior initially, and then also whether there were impacts on diet um, and nutrition further down the line because of this prolonged and extensive flooding event. So beginning first with some of the short term effects, we first looked at probably the most obvious thing that you would all imagine, essentially whether the animals tried to move away from flooded areas into habitats at higher elevation or further away from the edge of the flood, um, whether they just moved out of their typical home range um, altogether and tried to escape the flood. So this plot here is showing changes in the strength of habitat selection for a range of different resources with strength of selection on the y-axis with no selection shown at zero by this um, gray line here, and then selection for different habitat variables uh, these positive values above the line and selection against or avoidance of specific habitat variables um, are the values below the line there. And I want to just zoom in on a couple of specific habitat variables. And note for this part of the study, we weren't able to assess the full mammal community because we were only tracking a subset of the species. So the five species represented here are those that we had uh, GPS collars on at the time, so we could actually assess changes in their movement behavior. So first I want to look at probably the most obvious one, and that's whether or not animals change their selection for elevation. Um, and so we looked at how they were selecting for this variable before the cyclone, shown in purple, and after the cyclone, shown in yellow. And we found a really consistent response. So regardless of the species that we looked at, all of them uh, increased their selection for higher elevations uh, following the cyclone. So they did kind of what you would expect them to do. They tried to get the hell out of there um, and move to higher areas out of the uh, way of the water. Interestingly though, when we looked at changes in selection for distance to the edge of the flood, so whether or not um, animals decided to avoid that error and move away from the most flooded parts of the landscape, um, we found kind of an interesting pattern of response where most species showed some shift in their selection. You can see these bars are not exactly the same, but really the only species that showed a strong significant response uh, were the elephants, so the largest bodied species. Um, and we think this has to do with some kind of filtering effect of the size of these animals. So elephants are obviously very large. They can move greater distances much faster than something like a bushbuck, which weighs 40 to 50 kilograms, uh, compared to a huge, uh, much, much heavier elephant. Um, and so elephants have the ability to actually move away from the flood flooded area, whereas these other species were potentially hampered by lower mobility because of their size and their locomotive capacity, and so not actually able to move away. And this is sort of somewhat supported even by looking at the second largest species, which is a kudu, roughly 200 to, yeah, 200 kilograms, depending on whether you're talking about males or females. They also showed a somewhat significant response when they increased their avoidance um, of that habitat closest to the flood edge. but the pattern was certainly not as strong as what we found in elephants. So in addition to selection, we then looked at whether the overlap and space use changed. So whether animals, regardless of what habitats they were in, just moved out of the area where they had been uh, prior to the cyclone. And again, the bars in purple show uh, patterns before the cyclone and yellow shows after the cyclone. So we compared five week periods from before the cyclone with the five weeks following uh, this flood event and looked at how space use overlap changes over time. So most animals tend to move around, even if they're residents, move around quite a lot within their home range. And so even in this kind of neutral period before the cyclone, you see some species have quite a lot of drift um, in their space use, so they tend to not have 100% overlap in their space use um, all the time. 
That said, though, we saw a pretty significant change in the consistency of space use in um, the smallest bodied species in the bushback, uh, which is kind of contrast what we saw in the selection analyses, uh, where they essentially moved completely into a new area of the landscape and had zero overlap uh, between their space use before and after the cyclone that persisted for um, at least four or five weeks after the cyclone hit. We saw maybe some indication of a similar pattern in the elephant, but really um, it was not much of a significant difference across the other species. And in this case, what we think is going on um, has to do with actually that other trait that I mentioned, that association with floodplain habitat. So despite their name, Bushbuck and Gorongosa are actually relatively strongly associated with the floodplain habitat um, in these open areas. And so potentially they were at the greatest risk from these flooded uh, from this flooded area, and so we're forced to move out um, a greater distance compared to these other species whose home ranges didn't typically overlap as much with that flooded area um, in the first place. So I want to zoom in a little bit on bushback because they are my favorite of these species, but they're also uh, really interesting in the context of this uh, cyclone story. So you remember I talked about species increasing air uh, selection for higher elevations. What's interesting about the elevation landscape in Gorongosa is that there's a, two different ways in which species could increase their elevation. So there's a slight increase in elevation as you move away from the edge of the lake, so um, away from Lake Urema, but there are also these termite mounds dotted throughout the landscape that are essentially little hills uh, that offer these kind of micro adjustments in elevation that potentially provided some relief to these animals um, at this time without actually having to move as far away as kind of gradually getting further away uh, from the edge of the lake. So what these termite mounds look like, this is an aerial shot of them. They're kind of these clusters of woody vegetation. And then this is a composite image of a whole range of different um, antelope foraging on one of these mounds. And you can see both how high they are, but also how um, wide they can be in diameter. So they can be several meters. So they actually do provide um, potentially a pretty substantial refuge in terms of higher elevation, but also foraging resources for these animals to kind of wait out um, the negative impacts of the cyclone. Interestingly, what we saw in bushbuck was kind of a bifurcation in their responses. So unfortunately, about half of the individuals, or at least a third to half of the individuals we had collared, died um, shortly after the cyclone. So they, uh, and we think it was very strongly related to how they responded to this um, flood event. So the individuals that survived, we saw a really um, interesting and kind of strategic use of termite mounds among these individuals. And these are just two examples, but the patterns were generally the same between those that uh, died and those that did not. So for individuals that survived, like this one here, what we saw is that they uh, made strategic use of termite mounds across the landscape. So this individual initially moved um, a little further away from the floodwaters, and then more gradually moved uh, onto kind of clusters of termite mounds <coughs> using these um, elevation refuges to escape the floodwaters. And eventually, once they reached kind of, I guess, a safer, less flooded part of the landscape, um, kind of hoofed it down to an entirely new home range, and they were able to survive um, and carry on down there. The individual that died, um, or most of the individuals that died, they tried to do a similar thing, but they made bad decisions. So this individual, uh, climbed onto a termite mound, but this mound was relatively isolated in the landscape, so there were not many other mounds close by. It also wasn't as large, it didn't have as many uh, good foraging resources for that individual. And so it's, it essentially became trapped on top of the mound and was there for several days or probably even weeks, exhausting all the vegetation and resources on that mound and eventually succumbing um, to starvation before the floodwaters receded and it could actually get off the mound and, and move around again. So what this suggests is not only is it important to understand different species traits um, and how that's going to influence their responses to these extreme weather events, but also the importance of behavioral diversity within populations um, of different species. Because if all the bushback had behaved in the same way, they either, well, if they'd gotten lucky, would have all survived. But if they'd all behaved like this guy, uh, the entire population might have been wiped out uh, from this one flooding event. So having this kind of portfolio effect of different strategies in a population will, will likely be important for populations to survive these kinds of extreme weather events. So looking now at the long-term effects 
The way that we examined these was on how this extended inundation event impacted the available forage and also the quality uh, of this forage for the large herbivore community. And we initially looked at um, a reasonably coarse estimate of the overall productivity or availability of high quality green vegetation in the landscape um, using NDVI, which is a nice remotely sensed proxy for that greenness um, and high quality vegetation in the landscape. And what we found is that throughout the year, sort of with the ebb and flow of floodwaters, you see this um, pattern of shifts in NDVI in Gorongosa in typical years. So these are shown in purple here. But during the cyclone year, we saw this sudden drop in NDVI, which is obviously due to most of the vegetation being covered in water. Uh, but even once the floodwaters receded, so more like around here um, in May, we saw that NDVI was still a lot lower. And we, what we think is going on here is that a lot of plants in Gorongosa are flood adapted species. So they're used to being underwater for a period of time and they're able to recover pretty quickly once the floodwaters recede. But what happened with the cyclone is that a lot of plants that aren't adapted to that kind of lifestyle were covered and they're also covered for a lot longer um, than they're potentially used to um, being in a typical year. And so they either died or took a lot longer to recover, which meant that that green vegetation was delayed um, in availability down here uh, for the large herbivore community. So we then looked at how it impacted the diets of different species. And in this case, we could examine a wider range of different species because we were collecting um, fecal samples from a whole range of different species, not just those we have GPS collars on. And we looked at a measure of diet turnover. So this is how much the diet composition in terms of the species that they're eating changes between seasons. So these purple um, box plots here are showing the typical turnover um, in a given year as it shifts from the wet season to the dry season um, and back again. And then these yellow points here are showing that turnover in the cyclone year. And you can see for quite a few species, there were elevated uh, levels of diet turnover, suggesting that the impacts of the flood on the vegetation prompted species to shift their diets more dramatically than they would have to um, otherwise. And in particular, these effects were strongest for those that had this higher association with the floodplain. So um, RB, which is a really tiny little antelope, and these are not to scale, but <laughs> certainly this is the smallest and this is the largest species. Um, and other, other species like um, bushbuck, waterbuck, all the species that spend most of their time on the floodplain were uh, most highly impacted in terms of their diet composition. And we also found differences in diet quality, although these were a little bit more nuanced and maybe not quite as clear. Um, so we looked at a few different measures of plant nutritional quality and general toughness of the diet. Um, so digestibility, and then also uh, lignin content, so measures of essentially how tough and hard to digest the diets are. And then the nutritional content in terms of phosphorus um, and sodium here. And what we found in general is that the diets became less digestible and lower in nutrients, at least initially. Um, we saw a drop in digestibility in the cyclone year um, and an increase in lignin, and then a drop in phosphorus and a drop in sodium. And these persisted into the early dry season, although you'll see by the late dry season, things are kind of evened out again as the plant community was able to recover uh, more fully from the cyclone. And I don't have time to get into it today, but we did find that these differences in diet and diet quality actually led to differences in the nutritional condition of these animals and that they were in poor condition. And we also saw some pretty substantial decreases in the population abundance of several of these species, particularly the small bodied floodplain associated species um, following the cyclone. So there were some demographic impacts um, of this flooding event on these populations. Okay, so from what was really somewhat an opportunistic project, we were able to see how species traits are gonna potentially impact um, their responses to these extreme weather events as they continue to increase in intensity and frequency. And I'd also like to emphasize again how important um, it appears to be for animal populations to have a diversity of behavioral <coughs> strategies um, as that's going to affect how they're able to respond and then survive and persist um, as these events continue in the future. Okay, so I'd now like to switch gears from kind of the doom and gloom of climate change to a potentially more hopeful um, and optimistic challenge uh, that populations are facing today. And that is the growth um, in kind of the popularity and extent of ecological restoration and rewilding uh, projects 
across the globe. So these are obviously overall a really great and exciting thing, um, but they present challenges for the communities that are undergoing these types of events where species are being removed or reintroduced, the abundance of different species and the general composition of the ecological community um, is changing. And this can result in some really interesting shifts to wildlife habitat relationships. So I'm gonna just talk about uh, one of those today. We're gonna turn back to Gorongosa because not only was Gorongosa unfortunately hit by a huge cyclone, but it also has a really interesting history um, in which it's part of an active ecological restoration process um, and a rewilding initiative uh, because of population losses suffered during the Mozambican Civil War. So fortunately, um, for those of us that do research in Gorongosa, we have some really valuable baseline information. So we know what the park used to look like before this, um, the Mozambican Civil War and these large population declines. <coughs> So the aerial surveys that were taken uh, prior to the Civil War show a really um, abundant large mammal community. You can see it's dominated by mega herbivores, so things like elephant, hippopotamus, um, and African buffalo. They form the vast majority of the biomass with a much smaller amount uh, made up of mesoherbivores or mid-sized antelopes. And during the Civil War, these populations all suffered uh, very similar levels of decline. Some were nearly extirpated, or many were nearly extirpated from the park. But fortunately, the restoration and rewilding efforts in Gorongosa have been really effective. Um, and we now see biomass levels roughly similar to what they were prior to the war. Um, although you'll note that the species composition is now completely flipped. So instead of having a community dominated by uh, these really large animals, uh, like elephants and hippos, we now have the dominant uh, biomass being made up of mid-sized antelopes or mesoherbivores, so things uh, you might be familiar with, like wildebeest or zebra. Though in this case, uh, the composition in Gorongosa is a little more strange, and I'll get to that in just a second. And at the same time, all of this is happening with the large herbivore community. We also saw the same declines in the large carnivore community, and these species did not really naturally recover in the same way. And so recently, they have been the focus of uh, huge reintroduction and rewilding efforts, where park managers have reintroduced. Um, lipid, hyena, um, African wild dogs, and then also conducted really intensive anti-poaching efforts to allow the lion population to recover um, more naturally. And now they're all doing really well, and so we're getting closer uh, to what they were like uh, prior to the Civil War. So as I mentioned, there's been this dramatic shift in species composition um, among the large herbivores in Gorongosa. And what's really interesting about this is that Obviously, the amount of mesoherbivores in the park has increased, but it's been very uh, differential depending on which species you look at. So these plots here just show the densities of different species through time. The first bar showing what they were prior to the war, um, the second, <coughs> the first survey after the war, and then the subsequent recovery. So you can see for some species like zebra and wildebeest, this recovery has been really stagnated. So they really haven't recovered very well um, at all. Um, the populations just really struggled to get back from that remnant um, amount that it was after the war. However, if we look at another mesoherbivore, the waterbuck, you can see this population has been doing really well, just from looking at the bars, you can see that. Um, you probably can't see this because it's too small, but uh, if we look at the y-axis here, you'll actually see some pretty crazy density levels where waterbuck actually are now at densities of over 30 individuals per kilometer squared. In Gorongosa, which is not just uh, an impressive number in general, it's actually the highest recorded density for this species anywhere uh, throughout its range. So it's really an unprecedented number of animals within um, what is a large national park, but when you have thousands and thousands of water buck, it starts to feel maybe a little crowded. So I want to just give a little bit of background about water buck because it's kind of important to understanding their specific story um, in Gorongosa. So they are a large grazing antelope and as the name suggests, they're highly water dependent. So they're typically found in wetland habitats or adjacent to things like lakes um, or rivers. They really need to um, be close to water. That's certainly where they prefer being. They're also highly gregarious. So females um, and subadults tend to hang out in uh, relatively large herds. And then there are usually um, a few dominant males in each population that occupy the best territories, typically at the edge of these water sources, so in Gorongosa around the edge um, of Lake Urema, and they compete um, for breeding opportunities with females. So given their preference for uh, 
water and wetland habitats. Historically in Gorongosa, water buck were really only found um, in that floodplain habitat. So they really didn't venture beyond that green area that I showed you on the map earlier around the edge of the lake. And they weren't typically found um, in savanna habitat. But what we observed with this huge growth in their population is a change in their distribution and a change in their relationship uh, to their habitat in, the, in this national park. So historically, as I said, they were confined to this floodplain habitat, which is shown in green, and all of these points are just aerial count um, survey data of um, individual or group waterbuck sightings. So that's what the size of the circles represent. So these are our two surveys from prior to the war. And there's very few uh, dots in this brown savanna habitat. After the war, this probably needs very little explanation. You can see just how rapidly this population has expanded, both in terms of its numbers, but also in terms of its distribution. And so individuals are creeping into the savanna habitat. And when we look at this in terms of density, we can see both this huge population growth that's occurred uh, on the floodplain, which is this green bar here, um, where it's really kind of an exponential increase um, in density. But then we also see in more recent years, this increase in density of individuals occupying uh, the floodplain habitat, which is shown in yellow here. <coughs> and what we suspect it might be going on is that these water buck were essentially allowed to grow without any limitations. So as, at the time when the recovery started, there were very few predators. Um, there were also very few competing species. Almost all these herbivore populations suffered really heavy declines at this time. And water buck, by kind of chance in a, I guess a series of fortunate or unfortunate events, together, depending on whether you like water buck or not, um, tended to survive in slightly higher numbers than other uh, comparable meso herbivore species. And we think this has to do with the fact that they were really confined to this interior floodplain habitat, which is very swampy, which meant it was more inaccessible to poachers. Um, they were more, less likely to get snared, which is, was the cause of death for many of the other uh, large herbivores in this system. And so it may have been that they simply had a slight head start on all these other populations when the restoration process began, and they were able to grow uh, really rapidly to the point where they're potentially suppressing the recovery of other large herbivore species through interspecific competition. What we wanted to understand was, given that waterbuck seem so closely associated with wetland habitats, that's what they're named for, how were they able to survive, uh, you know, and continue to grow in such large numbers and start to occupy these new habitats uh, down there uh, um, in the savanna, which represents a really different environment to their typical floodplain habitat. And so what we looked at was a series of predictions that were targeted at understanding the specific ecological and behavioral ways in which waterbuck were adjusting to this new habitat, and in doing so, allowing their population to continue to grow and expand, even though they were probably reaching um, a density dependent or a carrying capacity in their preferred floodplain habitat just because of the sheer number of individuals occupying that space. So first we predicted, um, kind of getting at those density dependent effects, that we would see depletion of resources by water buck in their preferred floodplain habitat. So in order for density dependence to be um, the mechanism that was prompting individuals to move into this um, less preferred savanna habitat, there needed to be some uh, competition for resources and depletion of those resources on the floodplain. Unfortunately, we actually had some um, large herbivore exclosures, so these kind of big fenced areas out on the floodplain uh, for several years that allowed us to test whether this was what was going on. But what we found was that in the exclosures shown in the green bar here, uh, the plant biomass was a lot higher. So these are areas where waterbuck are not able to forage, they're not able to deplete the vegetation, waterbuck and, and everything else uh, that's out on the floodplain too. And then we compared these with control plots that were freely open, uh, where all the vegetation could be consumed by water buck if uh, they so desired. And so what we found was that the, in the exclosures, they, they retained a higher plant biomass. And this graph is a little noisy, mostly to do with fluctuations in rainfall from year to year. You can see there was a pretty strange uh, well, high rainfall year um, in, two, in 2017 2018. But just looking at this visually, when we compare inside the exclosures to outside the exclosures, you can see just how much of a difference there was in the vegetation available. So essentially, water buck on the floodplain are denuding this habitat of vegetation, increasing competition for resources within uh, their population. So we then wanted to see how water buck that were moving into the savanna were coping with this environment and whether or not they were shifting their diets, 
and what the differences in the content and quality of these diets were between these two habitats. And we expected they would be pretty different because the savannah and the floodplain are very different habitat types. The floodplain is essentially an open grassland habitat that spends a good part of the year underwater, whereas the savannah is a more typical, more wooded savannah habitat that has a mixture of grass and, um, and woody plants as well. So we first use um, some fecal samples, again, uh, as we did with the cyclone analyses. And we looked at um, the plant composition using a DNA meta barcoding method. And we did this across several different years, and we found distinct clusters of savanna waterbuck diets and floodplain waterbuck diets. So these plots are um, NMDS plots, which are kind of like a principal components analysis, if you're familiar with that where points that are closer together are more similar in their diet composition compared to points uh, that are farther apart being less similar in their diet composition. And so you can see through time, there were somewhat distinct clusters of floodplain and savanna um, diet samples suggesting that they differed in, in the plant species composition uh, from one another. And we then used these plant species to measure several different plant traits that could provide measures of the quality of these different diets. And what we found was that the individuals that remained on the floodplain were actually consuming higher quality diets, which makes sense because this is a preferred habitat for waterbuck. In theory, it should provide them with better resources than less preferred habitats. And so we found that floodplain diets were higher in digestible energy and digestible protein, whereas savanna diets were substantially lower um, in both of these measurements, as well as other nutritional measurements that we looked at. So given these differences in diet, we then turn to differences in uh, behavior, and specifically movement and activity patterns. And in this case, we wanted to know how waterbuck and the savannah were coping with these lower quality diets, um, and whether or not they were doing anything differently in order to survive in a habitat that they really didn't prefer to be in, um, at least historically. And we were able to look at this at a really fine scale because we had access to some really neat uh, behavioral data on the waterbuck. So we had waterbuck fitted with GPS collars that then had a camera kind of hanging around the neck of the collar that gave us um, this waterbuck's eye view, which is nauseating if you look at it for too long, um, <laughs> of what each waterbuck was doing throughout the day at the same time that we were collecting GPS data and accelerometer data on these individuals. And by integrating all these sources of information, we actually were able to develop an algorithm that classified their behavior into different behavioral states um, as you can see, kind of running down the bottom here, uh, this algorithm is classifying the waterbuck behavior as it switches between uh, different things. Most of the time, they're either eating or walking. Those are their two favorite things to do. <laughs> um, but um, what this meant is that we could then take these behavioral states, so these four different um, categories, and generate activity budgets for each of the waterbuck, uh, which allowed us to see what they were eating in different habitat types. And um, so not what they were eating, how much time they spent eating uh, in different habitat types and whether this varied um, in relation to their diets. I'm gonna switch this off because it's this is making me feel a little nervous, but I'm very close to it. Um, so what we found from these activity budgets was that interestingly, um, individuals that were spent more time in the savannah, so less of their time in grassland habitat, actually spent more of their time um, walking around at, or resting and not eating. So individuals on the floodplain were actively eating more of the time compared to individuals in the savannah. And this was kind of an interesting result uh, that took us a minute to kind of think about and scratch our heads around. But we think it has something to do with the ruminant uh, diet physiology of waterbuck, whereby if they're consuming lower quality diets, this means it's going to take longer to process through the guts of the waterbuck and they need to spend more time ruminating as opposed to actively eating. Um, it's, interestingly, individuals on the floodplain are also spending more time eating a lot of uh, very small forbs, which are kind of low-growing uh, weedy type plants, which means they eat, consume smaller bite sizes each time they eat those plants. So they may need to spend more time actively consuming vegetation, uh, whereas in the savannah, individuals were um, eating tougher, taller grass species. So in a single bite, they could gain a lot of vegetation that would then mean they would have to spend less time actually uh, eating that vegetation and more time processing it. So we also then tested whether these differences in diet and behavioral patterns led to differences in body condition. And interestingly, we found that the condition between individuals was very similar across the two habitat types, suggesting that whatever dietary differences there are at this point are not yet manifesting in differences um, in the condition and the physiology of these animals. 
but we also looked at energy budgets for each of these um, habitat types. And in this case, what we found is that individuals in the floodplain are still maintaining a higher energy balance than individuals um, in the savanna habitat. So what all of this suggests is that while the savanna habitat is a potential refuge for waterbuck with these high density dependent effects on the floodplain, it's potentially not a viable long-term refuge for these individuals, uh, mostly because they're consistently maintaining lower energy balance uh, in this particular habitat. And interestingly, as a follow-up um, to this study, what we've since seen um, in the waterbuck population and bringing it all back together in relation also to the negative impacts of the cyclone um, is that this population are starting to show the, um, evidence of nutritional impacts and slowing of their population growth rate. And so although they've been persisting and growing really rapidly for a long time, it does seem like they're high density and even with this expansion into the savanna habitat, they're starting to uh, show signs of approaching their carrying capacity and subsequent kind of evening out of their population size, which overall is a good thing because it's allowing other populations of mid-sized herbivores like the wildebeest in particular uh, to recover uh, more fully in this ecosystem. And just very quickly, I'm going to just skip this. I want to go through just one last example um, that is a little closer to home, so out of African savannas and into um, the mountains and plains of the American West, and talk about one challenge that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, mostly because we see these animals doing these sorts of things um, every year, and that is the challenges that migratory ungulates are facing um, across the American West as they try and move really long distances over large landscapes and face all sorts of barriers uh, to their movement. So these are three examples of some really impressive long distance migrations of pronghorn from Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming. There are many pronghorn that try to complete these journeys every year, but in doing so, they face many different barriers to movement and things like fences, um, can create bottlenecks where individuals are either unable to complete these migrations or strongly delayed in completing these migrations. And this is a really um, significant challenge because these migratory movements allow these animals to take advantage of spatio-temporally fluctuating resources and use different habitat types at different times of year, um, which is really critical to the success of these populations. And it's one of the reasons why we have um, ungulates that are able to reach the population sizes that they do because of these movements that they're able to make every year. So the question um, that's puzzling many people in this area is what we can do to actually protect and conserve these movements given the rapid rate of human population growth and the fact that probably more of these barriers are being uh, built um, and brought about every day, um, plus within kind of our ability to take them down. So several years of research have given us a really good sense actually of what we can do, particularly for migratory individuals. So by mapping their migrations, we can identify where key migratory corridors are. And this allows individuals um, to work together to protect those migratory corridors and keep those areas open for the free movement um, of these ungulate populations. But more recently, we've been faced with an additional challenge, and that is that not all individuals in a population show the same type of movement behavior. So even in a population of migratory pronghorn, which this population from Western Wyoming is classified as, we see a diversity of movement patterns where some individuals show migratory-like movements, some individuals roam around and look somewhat nomadic, and other individuals stay in the exact same place throughout the year. And what this means is that it becomes very challenging for managers to figure out a prescription for populations like this where there's no one-size-fits-all. So what is good for migratory individuals in this population may not be good for the nomadic or resident or individuals somewhere in between these strategies. Um, in these populations. And so what we wanted to do uh, with some of our research, uh, some of the work that I did in Wyoming, is try to see whether we could provide a first step to helping uh, managers figure out what to do with this variation in movement strategies. And specifically, what we wanted to look at was whether we could predict the frequency of these different types of movement strategies or general mobility of individuals in different populations based on the structure um, of the environments that these animals live in. And we looked at a range of different populations um, of pronghorn across the state of Wyoming to address this question. First, for this project, though, we needed a starting point. We needed somewhere to think about what might be the factors that would be influencing these different strategies and these different levels of mobility. And so we turned to existing 
uh, movement ecology theory, which has some really specific predictions um, on where we should find these different types of movement strategies. And it has to do with the specific structure of the environment these animals live in. So individuals um, that live in highly spatially heterogeneous environments, uh, but with low um, uh, predictability, or I guess high temporal predictability from year to year, tend to be migratory, whereas individuals that live in unpredictable environments tend to be more uh, nomadic. And this theory has been supported by a wide range of empirical literature, where we tend to find migratory individuals in those spatially heterogeneous but temporally predictable environments, like the mountains um, and plains surrounding the, the Rocky Mountain range. But we also see this for nomadic individuals, where nomadic populations, particularly of ungulates, tend to live in these uh, areas where resources are scarce in their distribution. They're also unpredictable in time. And a good example of this are the kind of steppe ecosystems uh, that we see in um, many different parts of Mongolia. So we decided to apply this general environmental framework to the mobility of these pronghorn populations across Wyoming and see whether these same environmental strategies could be used to predict the variation we were seeing in their movements. And therefore, we can make predictions across space. We can give kind of a starting point to managers on how to manage for uh, these different levels of mobility across um, all the pronghorn populations they have to manage across the state. And we had two objectives where first we wanted to quantify just how diverse the mobility of pronghorn was or is across uh, Wyoming. And we looked at eight different populations, roughly 400 individuals in total. And then we also identified these environmental variables, so how spatially heterogeneous and temporally predictable um, these environments were, and then the relationship between mobility and these environmental metrics. And this was somewhat challenging because pronghorn are extremely variable in their movement, even more so, I think, than elk, and especially more so uh, than mule deer. They're not just kind of migratory, nomadic, or resident. They're all those things and then everything else um, in between. And so we had to come up with some continuous ways of measuring their movement strategies rather than fitting them uh, into more categorical um, variables. And so what we did in this case was we looked at their consistency of space use throughout the year. So we measured how much from one month to the next pronghorn were moving about uh, within their range. And we examined this in terms of the entire year and then also just in terms of the consistency between their summer and winter ranges. And what this allowed us to do was place individuals on continuums from more resident to nomadic tendencies, and then from more resident to more migratory tendencies. So when we look at these at the same time, we can start to get a sense of where these different mobility patterns are present um, across the environment in Wyoming. So both metrics are shown um, on this map here. Each of these circles represent an individual pronghorn with the center of the circle um, at their home range centroid. So the first metric is measured in the size of the circles where larger circles are individuals that had higher year-round consistency or overlap in their space use, so more resident-like um, or lower mobility individuals, whereas um, the colors of the circles represent that consistency in space use between summer and winter. So individuals that have low values there are likely migrating between disjunct uh, summer and winter ranges, whereas individuals with higher values are staying in the same place um, and more resident in their behavior, so those darker purple um, circles there. And I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this one. That's not super important. But this is, these are the environmental variables that we um, quantify this temporal unpredictability and spatial heterogeneity of the environment. What's, uh, what is interesting about this, and I'll just quickly note, is that it kind of showed inverse patterns where environments that were highly predictable, so these smaller circles here, tended to be highly spatially heterogeneous. And, if you recall what I said about movement theory earlier, this has some interesting implications for where we find these different um, strategies, particularly migratory individuals across the state. So we looked at the relationship between these movement strategies and these environmental variables um, using regression models. And in the end, we were able to um, get our squared values between 0.3 and 0.4, so roughly 35% of the variation in pronghorn mobility was able to be explained by these environmental variables, which is a little unsatisfying as it leaves a lot of unexplained variation, but at the same time, in ecology, I like to think that <laughs> that is a relatively uh, good chunk of the variation we were able to explain there. And the pattern fell out in a way similar to what we expected, where migratory individuals or more migratory-like movements tended to be in these highly spatially heterogeneous environments with low 
um, unpredictability, unpredictability, so highly um, consistent from year to year. Uh, for example, this meant that migratory individuals tended to live in environments where that date of peak spring green up was roughly the same every year compared to uh, resident individuals or monomatic individuals where that date was much more variable and the timing of spring was less consistent from year to year. So there was some uh, kind of match between what we expected from ecological theory, but also some interesting differences, uh, which kind of comes back to this huge variability we see in pronghorn behavior, where there still remains to be a lot of unexplained variation. And there are a few factors we think um, will help us explain some of that variation that we're looking at currently, um, things like uh, learning of these behaviors among individuals, but also the impacts of humans in the form of hunting season. So a lot of these movements um, in pronghorn, pronghorn have been hunted in Wyoming for, gosh, a very long time, probably a century, uh, well, hunted with regulation <laughs> for probably a century at this point. Um, and there's a lot of association between when pronghorns start making these migratory-like movements and the onset or the end of hunting seasons in different parts of the state. So that's something that we're looking at currently. But importantly, I just want to um, highlight that we were able to actually predict where we would expect to see these different patterns of mobility um, across the state in Wyoming. So these grayed out areas are areas of fairly high elevation where uh, we didn't make predictions because pronghorns don't tend to live in those areas year round, though some of them will have their summer ranges um, in those areas. And you can see there's a lot of variation across the state and where we expect to find more resident individuals and nomadic and migratory individuals. And this is something that we're working on uh, with Wyoming Game and Fish to help inform, sort of as a starting point, how they think about management of these populations um, across the state and what the needs are in different regions. And in the future, what we're working on right now is replicating the same framework in elk populations across Wyoming. So, Elk also exhibit a high variation in their movement strategies. Many are really migratory or resident, but in the more desert landscapes of Wyoming, we also have nomadic populations. And these are just examples of three different um, elk living in a very similar environment. But you can see clearly throughout the year, they have very different patterns of movement. This looks quite like a migration. These maybe are more resident or even nomadic type movements. Okay, so hopefully with those three very rapid um, examples. Um, I've kind of provided a little bit more information on this overall picture and how we can connect these individual differences um, and underlying factors leading to individual differences in movement behavior to our overall understanding of wildlife habitat relationships, and particularly in the context of all of these emerging really complex challenges that these populations are facing um, today. And I just want to mention all my collaborators um, all of this work resulted from a ton of uh, work from all of these folks here, and I didn't have time to do it all justice today, um, and also to our uh, funding sources and other partners. Uh, hopefully I have a few minutes for questions. Thank you. Questions, comments, folks? Uh, folks online as well? How did you measure energy balance of the floodplain and the savanna water bug? Um, thank you. That's a great question. So uh, by pulling together a whole range of different uh, types of data, so there are actually relatively well-parameterized equations for how much um, locomotion costs in animals of a certain size. And so we were able to estimate rough approximations of how much, um, when they're in the walking state, how much energy they're expending versus in other states, so that kind of provided that cost side of the equation. And then in terms of the intake side of the equation, um, we actually used the videos to measure how often water buck were taking bites. And um, some of my collaborators then estimated, basically based on, that bite, on their bite size, how much they were consuming um, in each habitat type. I will say they're not the most precise estimates, but they gave us a good relative estimate of how the balance energy balance um, varies between those two habitats. We weren't able to include um, the cost of thermoregulation, which is probably a pretty important side of that um, cost equation for water buck or any um, animal living in this type of environment, but it gave us at least a sense of, based on the differences in diet between the two habitat types and the differences in how often they were moving around, sure. what that meant for their energy balance. Thanks. Yeah. Another question on water buck. Since water buck are typically associated with water, 
it, might, it seems like a little surprising they're moving so much further away from water itself, going into these savanna environments. Is there, were there water resources like perennial streams and stuff that were in those areas? Because are water buck dependent on water or are they dependent on more like aquatic vegetation that's associated with water itself? Because there's a difference between needing to drink versus the other things sort of associated with groundwater. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so they are, I guess on a scale of different herbivore species, relatively water dependent. They're not the most water dependent. Um, and they are, they do obtain most of their water, I guess, from water, but also from the vegetation that they eat. And they, most of their diet on the floodplain is made up of those, um, so called flood grass, um, that is really only found in that part of the landscape. Um, but there are some water sources in the savanna, obviously the animals that live there, um, also need water. So there are some rivers that are mostly dry uh, by the end of the dry season, but have water for probably two thirds of the year. And then there are also pans that flood in the wet season every year that at least in the early dry season um, have water. The interesting thing about the water buck in that habitat is that um, not only do they rely on water in the floodplain in general, but it's clearly important for their reproductive success in terms of this territoriality and mating opportunities. Um, you know, the best territories are those nearest the water. So we actually found in terms of the structure of the population is that the individuals in the savanna tended to be either subadults or um, senescent, senescent or post-reproductive males. So it was kind of a skew in the distribution, which suggests that maybe individuals that are less competitive or have less reason to compete for reproductive opportunities are the ones that are kind of like, this is too hot, I'm just gonna go here for a little bit and then, you know, maybe come back to the floodplain or yeah, so that was something I didn't have a chance to get to, but kind of interesting. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, in your Wyoming study, uh, so when you talk about your uh, sort of environmental variability that may be affecting whether pronghorn are a more resident-like or more migratory, et cetera, uh, among those factors, are there like spatial factors like uh, built environment, you know, like how accessible those areas are. You showed this, like, with you know, the highway. Um, like, are, were those, do you think those are part of the decision making that goes into pronghorn thinking whether they're going to migrate or uh, reside in a place or not? Really? Yes, yeah. Uh, so, pronghorn are, are relative, I guess, to other uh, ungulates are very sensitive to barriers to movement, especially fences. They won't cross them as readily as. Um, elk or, or deer will do. Um, but there was actually one huge barrier to movement within our study area, which is, as you said, is the um, Interstate 80 in South Wyoming. So we actually looked at, we were concerned about that too, we actually looked at whether distance or proximity to that highway was actually was a better predictor of these different strategies, um, since that highway has been around for a really long time. And we found that there was actually no real significant relationship there and the environmental variables that natural environmental variables are a more important predictor. Um, so whatever, we know I-80 is a barrier to the movement, but it seems like at least from our results, the overall structure of the environment is still more important. That is something we're looking at more closely with the elk study, because we know a lot more about how elk movements are impacted by agriculture, and private and public land. So we're actually directly integrating that into the analyses, which we didn't do with Prompton. Well, folks, we're nearing the end of the hour. We're right there. Maybe we could have one last question or comment, and then we'll wrap up. Well, if not, let's uh, thank. thank you.